Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for braving the weather and the Seattle traffic to come here tonight. <laughs> I'm really quite honored. So zombie science. In 2000, I published Icons of Evolution, in which I pointed out that many textbook images about Darwinian evolution used to, to convince students of Darwinian evolution misrepresent the evidence. And I concluded that much of what we teach about evolution is wrong. Well, the book attracted rave reviews. I should have known. Uh, I thought, my goodness, what have I done? But those reviews were not filled with lavish praise, but with furious denunciations. Some critics accused me of stupidly trying to discredit evolution simply by listing a few textbook mistakes. Here's one example. Because there are omissions, simplifications, and inaccuracies in some general biology textbooks, obviously the modern theory of evolution must be wrong. This is the astounding line of reasoning that is the backbone of Jonathan Wells's Icons of Evolution. This is even better. <clears throat> These two guys worked for the National Center for Science Education, which is a militantly pro-Darwin uh, lobby organization. <clears throat> they called me the wine expert. <laughs> Wells reminds us of those kids who used to write letters to the Superman comics many years ago. Dear editor, they would write, you made a boo-boo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, did it really affect the story? Wells cannot hurt the story of evolution. Like a petulant child, he can only throw tantrums. This is a characteristic, actually, of many of the criticisms I got in those days. So, <clears throat> were the icons of evolution just textbook boo-boos? Here's a real one, a real textbook boo-boo. This was in a physics textbook in 1997. <clears throat> That's a picture of the singer Linda Ronstadt with a caption underneath identifying her as an atom of arsenic, or sorry, a silicon crystal to which an atom of arsenic has been added. <laughs> <clears throat> On the very next page, there's a picture of a silicon crystal with arsenic added, and the caption says, triodes are used in microphones to amplify sound. <laughs> Obviously, the captions had been mistakenly switched and the publisher corrected the mistake in the next edition. But what if the identification of Linda Ronstadt as a silicon crystal were reproduced essentially unchanged year after year and in many different books, not just this one? What if the identification of Linda Ronstadt as a silicon crystal was consistent with other material in the books promoting the theory that life is based on silicon rather than carbon? And finally, what if the pictures are defended as correct even after the evidence has shown that life is not silicon-based? Well, that's what happened with the icons of evolution. Year after year, they're reproduced in textbooks, many textbooks, not just biology textbooks. They're part of a systematic pattern explicitly aimed at promoting Darwinian evolution. And they are defended vigorously nastily even, by the scientific establishment, even after the evidence has shown that Darwinian evolution and the icons are false. Now, a big ambiguity here is what we mean by evolution. It has several meanings. One is simply change over time, which nobody disagrees with, at least nobody that I've ever met. Uh, another meaning for evolution is minor changes within existing species. Again, I've never met anyone who disagrees with this. Uh, we can see right here in this room that it happens. Farmers have been observing it for centuries. It's not controversial at all. But what about the origin of new species, organs, and body plans? Well, this is called macroevolution, to distinguish it from the microevolution I just described. By the way, that distinction was uh, made by a Darwinian evolutionary biologist years ago. Well, certainly new species, organs, and body plants have originated in the history of life. Uh, I don't know anyone who denies that. But the problem comes when we use Charles Darwin's theory to explain macroevolution as due solely to unguided natural processes. Now, he wrote in The Origin of Species that his book was one long argument 
basically against creation by design. For Darwin, without the S, all living things were produced by unguided natural forces. He wrote in a letter later, I would give absolutely nothing for my theory of natural selection if it require miraculous additions at any one stage of descent. So Darwin's theory is materialistic. What is science? <clears throat> well, there are different meanings for science. One, the one that I prize most, is empirical science. That is, seeking truth by, com by formulating hypotheses and then comparing them with evidence. We have an idea, we check it against the evidence in the real world, and decide whether the idea is correct or we have to change it. In a sense, we're all scientists in this regard. But another meaning of science that's become especially popular since Darwin is materialistic science, that is, seeking natural explanations for everything. Explanations in terms just of material objects and the physical forces among them. Well, okay, that's, that's not a dishonest enterprise, but the problem comes when someone engaging in that thinks that everything actually has a natural or a materialistic explanation. Logically speaking, if I want to seek material explanations, at some point I might say, if I were honest, well, you know what, I don't have an explanation for that. Maybe it's just beyond my method. But in practice, unfortunately today, many scientists believe that there are material explanations for everything, and if they just persist in trying to find them, they will. Well, <clears throat> that led me to define another kind of science, <laughs> zombie science. By that I mean assuming that everything can be explained materialistically and then persisting in telling materialistic stories even after the evidence has shown that they are false. And this unfortunately happens quite a lot. In Icons of Evolution in 2000, I wrote about 10 images uh, common in biology textbooks that were used to tell the materialistic story, even though by 2000, they had been shown to be misrepresentations of the evidence. The Miller-Urey experiment, Darwin's Tree of Life, homology, Heckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, the fossil uh, bird with uh, claws, or, or with uh, teeth in its uh, beak and a long tail, uh, peppered moths, Darwin's finches, four-winged fruit flies, fossil horses, and the ape-to-human fossils, actually drawings, mostly. Well, I'm not going to go over all of those here tonight, but I will touch on four of them, <clears throat> just to so show you what has happened to these so-called textbook boo-boos. They're all still with us. The Miller-Urey experiment. In 1953, Stanley Miller, in the lab of Harold Urey, simulated what scientists then thought was the early Earth's atmosphere. This was an honest experiment. Miller was not out to, to trick anybody. The atmosphere he used contained methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor, and he used an electric spark to simulate lightning. So there's the spark. The water would boil here, the gases enter here, spark, and then the results would accumulate down here. And after a week, Miller analyzed these, this brown tar and found some amino acids, which are the chemical building blocks of proteins. And this was widely touted as uh, a, a step in explaining the first uh, step in the origin of life. This, this showed how the building blocks of life formed on the early Earth. That's, that's the way it was advertised. By 1980, however, geochemists had concluded from many kinds of evidence that the Earth's early atmosphere consisted of gases emitted from volcanoes and that any hydrogen that might have been there, being the lightest element, would have escaped the Earth's gravity into space. So here we have a comparison of the Miller-Urey gases, water vapor, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. Lots of hydrogen here, including lots of free hydrogen. And the volcanic gases, water vapor, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, a lot of oxygen here, and a few other trace gases as well. Well, in 1983, Miller himself, with a colleague, tried using a carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide atmosphere to produce amino acids. 
And they found that the, the glycine, which is the simplest amino acids, acid of the 20 some, some amino acids our bodies contain, glycine is almost the only amino acid produced from carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide atmospheres. And then, only if they added excess hydrogen. Well, remember, that was the first thing to disappear in the early Earth, according to geochemists. So they had to add excess hydrogen just to make this work. And if they wanted anything more complex, they had to add methane as well. So by 1999, it was clear that the experiment didn't work. This is uh, Freeman Dyson. Miller's experiment was supposed to be a true simulation of prebiotic, that is, pre-life chemistry, on the primitive Earth. But now, nobody believes this anymore, except the biology textbooks, which all used it to persuade students that life had a materialistic origin. So they were still being used in 2000. Now it's 2017, and it's still there. Here are three widely used textbooks, Kenneth Miller and Joseph Levine, Scott Freeman's Biological Science, Mater's Biology. All of them use the Miller-Urey experiment to convince students that scientists have explained the first step in the materialistic origin of life. So the conclusion here is the Miller-Urey experiment, like other icons of evolution, some of which I'll mention in a minute, persists because the science education establishment wants to indoctrinate students in a grand materialistic story of which this is the beginning. The icons serve to illustrate the story, but in every case, they misrepresent the evidence. This is zombie science. Moving on to the next icon, Heckel's embryos, which John West mentioned. <clears throat> for Darwin, this was by far the so strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory, that the embryos of the most distinct species, in his case he was thinking of vertebrate embryos, embryos of animals with backbones, are closely similar, but become, when fully developed, widely dissimilar. And in later editions, Darwin referred to these drawings made by his German contemporary, Ernst Haeckel. In the top row, according to Haeckel, we see the early forms of these embryos. So that's a fish, salamander, a turtle, bird, and four mammals. And they all look like little fish. Well, Haeckel's contemporaries accused him of fraud for distorting those embryos to make them look more similar than they really are. And in fact, he did. These are drawings based on actual embryos of those five different classes. Uh, fish, amphibian, in this case a frog, turtle, bird, and human. Uh, no embryologist would have any trouble distinguishing these from each other. And you can see that in Heckel's original drawings, they were made to look the same. In 2000, the year icons came out, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote that we should all be astonished and ashamed by the century of, mind, century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not a majority, of modern textbooks. And he was absolutely right. But making those embryos look more similar than they really are was not even Heckel's biggest misrepresentation. Early vertebrate embryos actually start out looking much different. Here's the stage that Heckel portrayed as the first, and he distorted these to make them look more similar. But if we go back to the earlier stages, the differences are much more striking. And it was Darwin's logic that the early embryos are supposed to show us what we looked like as a common ancestor. So the actual evolu uh, embryological evidence does nothing to help Darwin whatsoever. Yet, years later, we still have evolutionary biologists claiming that the embryos are most similar. Here's Jerry Coyne from the University of Chicago. All vertebrates begin development looking like embryonic fish because we all descended from a fish-like ancestor. Totally false. Textbooks. Here's a 2013 textbook, 2013, using Heckel's drawings as evidence for evolution. Now, more commonly, modern textbooks redraw the embryos in this fashion. This is Mater's biology from 2015. But the point is the same. These drawings still misrepresent the early embryos, 
not quite as badly as Heckel did, but the point is, these all look kind of like little fish, and then they develop into real fish, salamanders, birds, and so on. But remember, the early stages are over here, not even part of the drawing. So the drawing omits the early stages because that doesn't fit Darwin's logic. This again is zombie science. Moving on to another icon, famous one, peppered moths. Peppered moths come in a light variety and a dark variety. When the dark moths became more common in 19th century England, evolutionary biologists attributed this to survival because, of the, because they were better camouflaged on pollution-darkened tree trunks. That is, to natural selection. So, <clears throat> these, this is a tree trunk without pollution, light-colored, the light-colored moth is here, the dark-colored moth is here. The argument is that as the trees got darkened by the pollution, the dark moths were better camouflaged, and the birds ate the light ones. Very plausible, actually. The story and photos like the ones shown here became common in biology textbooks throughout the 2000s and even now. Well, even if the story were 100% true, it would show only a shift in the proportions of two existing varieties, that is, microevolution. In fact, microevolution is all that natural selection has ever been sh shown to accomplish. But, in the 1980s, same time actually that uh, Miller's uh, early Earth atmosphere was discredited, it became clear to biologists that peppered moths don't normally rest on tree trunks. The story was deeply flawed, and most of the photos, including the ones shown here, which are from a, a textbook in 2000, had been staged using dead moths pinned or glued in place. <laughs> Yet, many textbooks are still telling the story. Here's one from 2015, uses a drawing rather than a photo. But here's one from 2014 that actually uses the same photos again. This isn't empirical science. Next and final icon for a review of the 2000 icons, four-winged fruit flies. <clears throat> At the top is a normal fruit fly with two wings. At the bottom is a mutant fruit fly with four normal-looking wings. This is actually produced, this was produced in a, a laboratory of a Nobel Prize winner who combined artificially three separate mutations in a fruit fly embryo to make this fly. And it's very impressive. But <clears throat> the normal fly has two wings and two tiny structures behind them called balancers that vibrate rapidly during flight and which stabilize the insect in flight. The mutant fly has lost them. And the new wings have no flight muscles attached to them. So they're just dead weight. This fly is a helpless, uh, helplessly disabled. It can't live outside the laboratory. Yet, here's Kenneth Miller, textbook writer, writing in 2008. If we interfere with the genes, as the Nobel Prize winning scientist did for the four-winged fruit fly, by design or by accident, what might emerge is a fly with an extra set of wings. This led biologists to realize that the recipe for building the animal body is controlled by remarkably few genes, and that by studying small changes in those, they could also show how these genes produce variation, which is the raw material for evolution. Textbooks, 2014, 2014, 2015, photographs of four-winged fruit flies similarly used to convince students that DNA mutations can produce dramatic anatomical changes that provide the raw materials for evolution. Neither Miller nor these textbooks mentioned that four-winged fruit flies are helpless cripples that cannot live outside the laboratory. They're evolutionary dead ends, not raw materials for evolution. Not a word about that. While we're at it, let me ask, what can DNA mutations accomplish? We can, in fact, have mutated a fruit fly embryo as much as we like. It's called saturation mutagenesis. It's also been done in mice, fish, and worms. 
And as far as we can tell from the evidence, there are only three possible outcomes. A normal fruit fly that has overcome the mutations and developed anyway, a defective fruit fly, like the four-winged fruit fly, or worse, or a dead fruit fly. That's it. That exhausts the possibilities. So the materialistic claim that accidental mutations and natural selection can explain the origin of new species, organs, and body plants simply does not fit the evidence. So, tonight we celebrate the release of a book that talks about some additional icons of evolution. I won't say new icons, because actually they, many of these have been around for a long time as well. I just didn't have time or space to cover them in 2000. So I cover six in this book. DNA, the secret of life, walking whales, the human appendix, the human eye, antibiotic resistance, and cancer. I'm just going to touch on these very briefly because the details are in the book that many of you are holding in your hands. DNA. When Francis Crick and James Watson discovered the structure of DNA in 1953, they went to a local pub where Crick announced, we have discovered the secret of life. They thought they had discovered the secret of heredity and the secret of embryo development. In 1970, a prominent molecular biologist, Francois Jacob, wrote that an organism is the realization of a genetic program written in DNA sequences. The same year, his colleague, Jacques Monod, said that with this and the understanding of the random physical basis of mutation that molecular biology has also provided, the mechanism of Darwinism is at last securely founded, and man has to understand that he is a mere accident. Pretty powerful. But scientists have actually known for decades that organisms are not specified by a genetic program in their DNA. Many scientists don't even know this, but it's a fact. Uh, the literature shows it quite clearly. In addition to DNA sequence information, Organisms need other sources of information that are independent of their DNA. This may come as a surprise to you, but it's true. There's actually much more to the secret of life than DNA, and some of that's described in the book. Walking whales. In Darwin's time, two species of fossil whales had been discovered, Basilosaurus and Dorodon. But there were no fossils of intermediate forms to provide evidence that whales had evolved from land animals, as Darwin believed. Land animals come before whales in the fossil record, so it appears that whales had to have evolved from land animals. In the 1980s, a wolf-sized land animal was announced to be the ancestor of modern whales because it had a bone in its ear that resembled a bone up to that point found only in the ears of whales. It was named Pacacetus, or Pakistani whale. Cetus is the Latin word for whale. But critics pointed out that there was still a huge gap between Pacacetus and true whales, so the criticisms continued. Then, in 1994, scientists found a fossil they called Amulocetus natans, or walking swimming whale. And another group of scientists discovered Rhodocetus, and they announced that Ambulocetus and Rhodocetus now provided the intermediate forms between Pacacetus and true whales. So in 1994, Stephen Jay Gould wrote, the embarrassment of past absence has been replaced by a bounty of new evidence and by the sweetest series of transitional fossils an evolutionist could ever hope to find. I cannot imagine a better tale for popular presentation of science as though evolution and science were the same thing, or a more satisfying and intellectually based political victory over lingering creationist opposition. Well, eventually some other forms were found, and now textbooks routinely show a series of these fossils uh, as evidence that whales gradually evolved from land mammals. Though the arrows in this drawing are completely imaginary, Actually, even evolutionary biologists acknowledge that no one of these forms could have evolved into the, into the next one because they all have features they would have to lose 
in order to become the next form. So they're not actually ancestors and descendants, but the, the textbooks don't need to worry about that. <laughs> but here's the rub. All of the so-called walking whales, remember this is a whale just because it has a certain ear bone, was fully terrestrial. We have fully terrestrial, primarily terrestrial. These animals, it turns out, were land animals that had a lot of, spent a lot of their time in the water, like sea lions and otters. That was the structure of their anatomy. Uh, the fully aquatic whales up here are actually quite different. And the transition between the primarily terrestrial am, uh, amphibious mammals and the fully aquatic whales is still missing. Fully, fully aquatic whales actually differ from these amphibious mammals, mammals excuse me, in many respects. Some of them, a few of them, there's actually quite a few, are blowholes. So these animals all breathe through their nostrils at the front of their snout. These animals breathe through holes in the tops of their heads. Quite different, anatomically uh, and physiologically. Whales have flukes that are not at all like the tails of these amphibious mammals down here, or these terrestrial ones down here. Flukes are very complex structures, aerodynamically almost perfect, although, I mean, they're in the water, but the, the flow over them has been determined to be almost ideal. They have their own tendons connecting them to muscles in the tail. Here's the tail, here's the fluke. And so the fluke is actually moved independently of the tail to propel the animal through the water. And these, these whales, some of them can reach speeds of 30 miles an hour in the water, quite fast. Uh, these are not like the passive flippers of a scuba diver. They're active muscles. Uh, internal testicles. <clears throat> sea lions have external testicles, but the streamlined bodies of fully aquatic whales have internal testicles. Well, unless these testicles are cooled, they're sterile. And a sterile whale is not a link in any evolutionary chain. <laughs> the system that cools these testicles is quite complex. It wouldn't have evolved before the testicles were internalized, and yet if the testicles were internalized before the system evolved, the animals would be sterile. So again, we have a, a big gap here between the amphibious mammals and the fully aquatic whales. Still a big question mark. The human appendix. Darwin said not only is the appendix uh, useless, and th the modern word for that is vestigial, but it is sometimes the cause of death. He wrote, on the view of descent with modification, we may conclude that the existence of organs in a rudimentary, imperfect, and useless condition, like the appendix, far from presenting a strange difficulty as they assuredly do on the ordinary doctrine of creation. After all, why would a creator make an animal with a useless organ? So Darwin argued it would, could be anticipated on his theory of descent with modification. But in 1900, British anatomist Richard Berry reported, on considerable evidence, that the human appendix is actually an important part of the immune system, which helps us to fight disease. Berry concluded that the appendix is not, therefore, a vestigial structure. Well, forget the evidence. The 2014 edition of Raven and Johnson's Biology tells students that the human appendix is apparently vestigial. It is difficult to understand vestigial structures such as these as anything other than evolutionary relics, holdovers from the past. According to University of, Berkeley, uh, University of California Berkeley website, which was updated last year, all life bears the scars of its history, including humans. Our awkward wisdom teeth and appendix are simply historical holdovers that evolution has not managed to get, man managed to rid us of. Well, fortunately, because our immune system might be compromised if it had. Now, you can get by without your appendix if you have to have it removed. I had my tonsils removed when I was a kid, uh, and we have other systems that can back them up uh, in the immune system. But the fact is the appendix is known, not just based on Barry's work in 1900, to serve as a, a part of our immune system. It also serves as a safe house for beneficial bacteria 
We need bacteria in our intestines to digest our food. After a serious bout of diarrhea, a person may lose all those beneficial bacteria, and the appendix can actually reseed the intestines and keep that person alive. So there are two known functions of the human appendix which are ignored by these evolutionary biologists. And the evidence was there for a long time. The human eye. In the human eye, indeed in the eyes of all animals with backbones, the light sensing cells, which are here shown in blue and green, face away from the incoming light. The blue cells are rod cells, which are so sensitive they can detect a single photon. The green cells are less sensitive, but they see color. The rod cells just see black and white. So these are very sensitive cells, uh, but evolutionary biologists look at this and say, this is obviously an example of bad design. Who in his right mind would put the, the light sensing cells on the side away from the light? Instead, they argue it's evidence for unguided evolution. So according to Richard Dawkins, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires, that is the nerves, leading backwards toward the brain. He would laugh, as Dawkins does, at any suggestion that the photo photocells might point away from the light. According to Kenneth Miller, who we've run into several times here, no designer would suggest that the neural wiring connections should be placed on the side that faces the light, rather than on the side away from it. Incredibly, this is how the human retina is constructed. And like Dawkins, uh, Miller argues that this is a result of evolution. It's an accident of evolution that leads to flaws, rather than a design feature. But it has been known for decades, long before Dawkins and, and Miller wrote these opinions, that uh, the light-sensing cells in the human retina have the highest metabolic rate of any tissue in the body because the demands on them are so high. So they need a generous supply of blood, back here in red, uh, that's uh, mediated by a layer of cells called the retinal pigmented epithelium, which is between the blood ve vessels and the light-sensing cells. Now, if these are removed, the light-sensing cells die, and we would be blind. But if these are put in front of the retina, between the light-sensing cells and the light, we'd also be blind, because blood is opaque. Light, it doesn't admit light. The nerve cells, as it turns out, are relatively transparent. So by having the nerve cells here, the light gets through to the photosensing cells, which are then nourished essentially by this blood and these uh, retinal epithelial cells, retinal epithelial cells. So it turns out that Dawkins and Miller and, and actually many other evolutionary biologists look at the retina and without even checking the evidence, which is in uh, medical school textbooks, anatomy textbooks, has been for decades, they just assume that they know more and that they know how an eye should be designed, and obviously this is evidence for evolution. That to me is bewildering, to make statements like that without even checking the evidence. Finally, moving on to antibiotic resistance and cancer, advocates of a new discipline become popular in the last few decades called Darwinian medicine, claim that nothing in medicine, especially antibiotic resistance and cancer, makes sense except in the light of evolution. And they actually actively try to force uh, medical examining, examining boards, medical schools, uh, licensing associations to require courses in evolution of medical students. They don't persuade physicians that it's needed, because physicians usually know better. So they go to the, the administrators and try to convince them to force students to study evolution. But actually, Darwinian medicine has contributed nothing to overcoming medical problems. All it does is it provides materialistic stories about why we get sick. Physicians don't need that. They need to know how to cure disease, not to be able to explain how, how it happened materialistically. So Darwinian medicine has actually done us no good. Now, some people claim that antibiotic resistance and cancer provide evidence for evolution. In antibiotic resistance, a few cells emerge in a population 
that resist an antibiotic, so the antibiotic kills off the other cells and the resistant cells are left and they multiply and take over. So this is a form, in a sense, of microevolution, somewhat like the, the peppered moth, where a certain variety uh, becomes predominant in a population where before it was a, a very small percentage. That's microevolution. That's all antibiotic resistance shows us. And I get a kick out of people saying that cancer provides good evidence for evolutionary theory, because for me it's like saying I have a theory for the origin of modern civilization, and my best evidence is the night of the living dead. Cancer kills. <laughs> it doesn't help us evolve. <laughs> so, my last chapter is called Zombie Apocalypse. In uh, 1995, philosopher Daniel Dennett wrote that Darwin's idea, Darwin's dangerous idea, is like a universal acid. It eats through just about every traditional concept. And he's right. It eats through religion. Uh, Non-believers in the last few decades have increased threefold in America, and many of them explicitly attribute their non-belief to being convinced that science proves God is not there through Darwinian evolution. I mean, those are anecdotal stories, but they're common. <clears throat> uh, many major denominations have now endorsed something called the Clergy Letter Project, which is an, uh, a project started by a, an evolutionary biologist to enlist clergy in support of Darwinian evolution. And unfortunately, many liberal Christians in America have fallen for it. Education. The emphasis is no longer on teaching children uh, critical thinking, but indoctrinating them into materialism. And the, the actually, the, the technical literature of education and philosophy and psychology is full of articles by people proposing various methods to do this, even to uh, preschool children. Darwinism has corrupted science itself, where the highest value in science should be the search for truth, and for some people still is, uh, the quest for survival has become stronger. So scientists publish, 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 even before they have the evidence to, to support their results. And the number of retractions since 2000 has skyrocketed. Retractions because of uh, poor science. The other uh, clue to how science has been corrupted is the hysterical reaction of the scientific establishment to intelligent design. Not to debate the evidence for and against it, but to call it things like terrorism, uh, the end of civilization, the endarkenment, all of these are actual quotations from mainstream scientists. Uh, intelligent design is, uh, is treated like a leper. We're treated like lepers. And uh, to me, this is a sign that uh, science has lost its soul. Sorry, too fast there. <clears throat> but I conclude that there's actually room for hope, a lot of room for hope. First of all, there's a growing awareness among scientists that evolutionary theory is broken. In November 2016, many prominent evolutionary biologists gathered at the Royal Society in London to produce a new theory to replace neo-Darwinian evolution, which they knew was not working. Uh, they failed, but they tried. The one thing they would not allow at the meeting was intelligent design, even though, ironically, a large proportion of the people in the audience were ID advocates who were not allowed to speak. There is increased support for intelligent design uh, in funding, financially, so much so that new scientific research projects are now being started up at major universities around the world. This is a very good sign for uh, a new science like intelligent design. Finally, uh, coming up soon on May 5th and May 6th, McKenzie University in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in collaboration with the Discovery Institute, will inaugurate a new intelligent design research center there. Very important event. Uh, many people expected to attend the inaugural uh, celebration. These, to me, are signs that the times are changing, 
and that zombie science uh, will fade into the background before too long. Thank you. <laughs>